Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Luke 6, verses 46 to 49, and then through J.C. Rao's expository thoughts on Luke. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Luke, chapter 6, verses 46 to 49. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose and the stream broke against that house and it could not shake it because it had been built well, But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. This is the word of the Lord. It has been said, which much truth, that no sermon should conclude without some personal application to the consciences of those who hear it. The passage before us is an example of this rule and a confirmation of its correctness. It is a solemn and heart-searching conclusion of a most solemn discourse. Let us mark, in these verses, what an old and common sin is profession without practice. It is written that our Lord said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? The Son of God himself had many followers who pretended to honor him by calling him Lord, but yielded no obedience to his commandments. The evil which our Lord exposes here has always existed in the church of God. It is found 600 years before our Lord's time in the days of Ezekiel. My people come to you as they usually do and sit before you to listen to your words, but they do not put them into practice. With their mouths they express devotion, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. Ezekiel 33, 31. It was found in the primitive church of Christ in the days of James. Be doers of the word, he said and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James 1.22 It is a disease which has never ceased to prevail over Christendom. It is a soul-ruining plague, which is continually sweeping away crowds of gospel hearers down the broad way to destruction. Open sin and avowed unbelief no doubt slay their thousands, but profession without practice slays its tens of thousands. Let us settle it in our minds that no sin is so foolish and unreasonable as the sin which Jesus here denounces. Common sense alone might tell us that the name and form of Christianity can profit us nothing so long as we cleave to sin in our hearts and live unchristian lives. Let it be a fixed principle in our religion that obedience is the only sound evidence of saving faith and that the talk of lips is worse than useless if it is not accompanied by sanctification of the life. The man in whose heart the Holy Spirit really dwells will never be content to sit still and do nothing to show his love to Christ. Let us mark, secondly, in these verses, what a striking picture our Lord draws of the religion of the man who not only hears Christ's sayings, but does Christ's will. He compares him to one who built a house and dug deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Such a man's religion may cost him much. Like the house built on a rock, it may entail on him pains, labor, and self-denial, to lay aside pride and self-righteousness, to crucify the rebellious flesh, to put on the mind of Christ, to take up the cross daily, to count all things but loss for Christ's sake. All this may be hard work, but like the house built on the rock, such religion will stand. The streams of affliction may beat violently upon it, and the floods of persecution dash fiercely against it, but it will not give way. The Christianity which combines good profession and good practice is a building that will not fall. Let us mark, lastly, in these verses, what a mournful picture our Lord draws of the religion of the man who hears Christ's sayings but does not obey them. He compares him to one who without a foundation built a house upon the earth. Such a man's religion may look well for a season. An ignorant eye may detect no difference between the professor of such a religion and a true Christian. Both may worship in the same church. Both may use the same ordinances. Both may profess the same faith. 
The outward appearance of the house built on the rock and the house built without a solid foundation may be much the same. But the day of trial and affliction is the test which the religion of mere outward professor cannot stand. When storm and tempest beat on the house which has no foundation, the walls which looked well in sunshine and fair weather are sure to come to the ground. The Christianity which consists of merely hearing religion taught without doing anything is a building which must finally fall. Great indeed will be the ruin. There is no loss like the loss of a soul. This passage of scripture is one which ought to call up in our minds particularly solemn feelings. The pictures it presents are pictures of things which are daily going on around us. On every side we shall see thousands building for eternity on a mere outward profession of Christianity, striving to shelter their souls under false refuges, contenting themselves with a name to live while they are dead, and with a form of godliness without the power. Few indeed are the builders upon rocks, and great is the ridicule and persecution which they have to endure. Many are the builders upon sand, and mighty are the disappointments and failures which are the only result of their work. Surely, if ever there was a proof that man is fallen and blind in spiritual things, it may be seen in the fact that the majority of every generation of baptized people persist in building on sand. What is the foundation in which we ourselves are building? This, after all, is the question that concerns our souls. Are we upon the rock? Or are we upon the sand? We love, perhaps, to hear the gospel. We approve of all its leading doctrines. We assent to all its statements of truth about Christ and the Holy Spirit, about justification and sanctification, about repentance and faith, about conversion and holiness, about the Bible and prayer. But what are we doing? What is the daily practical history of our lives, in public and private, in the family and in the world? Can it be said of us that we not only hear Christ's sayings, but that we also do them? The hour comes and will soon be here when questions like these must be asked and answered, whether we like them or not. The day of sorrow and bereavement, of sickness and death, will make it plain whether we are on the rock or on the sand. Let us remember this the times and not trifle with our souls. Let us strive so to believe and so to live, so to hear Christ's voice and so to follow him, that when the flood arises and the streams beat over us, our house may stand and not fall. That is the end of Rao's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today. May the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for his glory. In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, Ryle says that obedience to Christ's commands is the clearest evidence of saving faith. What are some of those evidences in our lives? Second, what are different forms of temptations and persecutions we have weathered because, by God's grace, we have a firm foundation in Christ? And third, Brothers and sisters, it is not enough that we love to hear the gospel, approve of its leading doctrines, assent to statements of truth about Christ, about justification and sanctification, about repentance and faith, about holiness and Bible and prayer. The question is, what difference do these things make in our lives?